behalf of the uh, Scan OSS family, I wanted to thank, first of all, the organizers for the space, once again. Thank you, everybody. I'll be talking about the Scan OSS journey from an open source company to open data. I'll start by talking about Scan OSS, in case you're not familiar with, uh, with the company and the open source projects. And then I'll cover what we have done in the open source um, part of the journey and what we have done in the open data part of the journey. So, software, um, open source is, is growing. Open source continues to grow because the adoption of open source continues to grow. Over 90% of our software is open source. And open source continues to grow because software continues to grow as well. Try to think in your head five companies that switched or are switching from hardware to software. It will be very easy to fill out those five spots. And software technologies are evolving in a way that they make the inclusion of open source easier. New programming languages, package managers, make, and even AI-assisted technologies, make the process of bringing open source into our software involuntary. And to the attorneys, or well, the attorneys in this room are very well informed in, in, in open source matters, but to the attorneys in general, bringing third-party code into our code is an involuntary process. However, as companies, we must produce compliant and safe and secure products. And if we do not know the open source we're using, this is a big challenge. So the, the fact that we don't know doesn't really relieve us from the obligations on license conditions and, and having to keep uh, compliant and make compliant products. Scan OSS is a software composition analysis platform, disruptor, because we are open source and, and open data, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The company is registered in Spain, which is a good thing because Spain is no longer about tapas and, and museums, right? Now there is <laughs> us also there. Uh, and it's 30 of us already, we passed the 30 uh, mark still, a small, small family. Uh, our CEO, uh, Alan, is a former C executive at Black Duck. Uh, I myself come from uh, long years at Ericsson and, uh, and Foss ID. And we have also key engineers from the SCA world and open source world in the, in the team. Now, what is the software composition analysis market today? Well, it, it started as a monopoly. Uh, of proprietary tools some 25 years ago. And although open source adoption grew, it continued to be uh, open um, proprietary software, which is it's actually uh, painful to see that along the years, companies helping companies identify open source do that with proprietary software. There is a, a saying in Spanish, we say, en casa de arreglo cuchillo de palo, and it sounds like a death threat from Antonio Banderas, but it actually means that in the uh, uh, blacksmith's house, wooden knights. And you have in, in English uh, a, a similar saying, it's uh, uh, the shoemaker's son was always barefoot. And I think in, in Swedish it's the same thing, right? It's a literal uh, translation. And this phrase is tried to illustrate the irony of someone making something for a living and not really using it for its own benefit. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it was. But you know, now uh, we, we are challenging this uh, status uh, quo, and we are actually an open source and open data uh, company. So it is possible to make, um, you know, to disrupt a market with uh, open source and with open data as well, which is what we have proven. 
So as a data company, the IP of our company is the actual knowledge base and the mining technologies to make and keep that uh, knowledge base updated. And this knowledge base contains published open source. There is no proprietary so uh, software and there is no unpublished open source there. So all open source. And building this knowledge base is a lot of work and it's expensive. It's over, over two petabytes of data that we downloaded and indexed over 200, it's, it's now 226, I think, million URLs as of today. That's 100 billion files and three trillion lines of code that we have indexed and then we can identify and pinpoint if you are using any uh, snippet from Stack Overflow or files from GitHub and, and, and down to, to snippet level, file level and, and component level. In creating and maintaining the knowledge base is expensive. You need a team of data scientists and curators. There's a lot of curation that needs to be done. Not everything is automatic. But once you have the database, and then once you've gone through updating it, because you have to keep it, it's just every second there are hundreds of component versions released. So keeping it updated is, is quite a challenge. And once you have it and it's updated, then you need to provide a reliable service at scale, which is also a challenge. It's also a dedicated operations team and lots of money in, in hosting. And yet, we have done this, and we're maintaining this, and we provide this for free. This is um, our first step into, into open data, providing free access to the knowledge base. And with this free access, what you can uh, do is, is have the detection of what is undeclared. There are plenty of tools to detect um, your dependencies by looking at your package manager files and dependency files. But that's the declare part of the, of the s um, There might be, I mean, if, if it's a native languages, it might have a subdirectory with code taken from uh, GitHub, your SRC external and a bunch of directories. There is no standard way of declaring that. I mean, if you're only looking at your uh, and XMLs, package and JSON, requirements, TXT, you, you don't have that in C or C++. And even if you are coding Python or, or, or Java, there might be code that you have taken from somewhere else, snippets, files. So it's, it's the, the detection of what's declared plus what is undeclared what gives you a complete software bill of materials. And that is what you can do today absolutely free and using 100% open source. Now, on the paid uh, set of features that we offer, starting from the bottom, well, we offer the option to have that whole knowledge base in-house, on-premise, which is what most of our customers choose. Um, then we also have extra layers of data, and not only we help companies identify open source, but we also provide intelligence on existing and, and non open source. Like, here's my yes and I want to know all the cryptographic algorithms um, for export control, for example, or the quality of the open source I'm using. We also allow to have this diff, you know, this left and right side of the screen with your code and the code that is matching in the community. There is a high precision snippet matching, so it's another layer of uh, um, snippet hashes that is overimposed to give more precision uh, and to rule out false positives. Uh, so that, those are some of the things that we offer in addition to the guaranteed throughput and availability and so on. Now on the, on the journey to open source, what we have done, we have released a crazy amount of stuff. Pretty much everything we do, um, our clients, our backend, the API, our mining software, everything is entirely open source. Um, so we use also, because we are an open source company, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. How do we detect the licenses, for example? We use Scanco, we have here uh, Philippe Ombreda. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe, for, for Scanco and for the package URL, which I think are massive contributions to the, to the open source community. Uh, we use SendRef to detect quality and, and, and so on. So everything we use to make our knowledge base is open source. And some of the contributions we have are minor, 
which is the tool that will pull stuff and then break it down, expand and, and index uh, all the and generate all this metadata. The engine is the actual scanning engine that will use that metadata to compare uh, your fingerprints to, to identify files and snippets. The API, we have um, uh, gRPC and, and uh, uh, REST, it's an uh, open API and protocol. Everything is open source, as well as the SDKs we built in, in, in uh, Python, Java, and JavaScript. And then we have CLIs that will allow you to extract those fingerprints and compare. So you can use our CLIs to scan your software and find uh, similarities with, with open source. We have a UI as well. Typical, if you're familiar with the proprietary tools in this uh, market where you just point to a directory, scan, and then you go through the, through the output in a, in a UI. And then plugins and extensions uh, like uh, IDEs. I mean, this world of shift left, you cannot really go farther left than actually in the, in the IDE when you're about to paste something. You know, the code you're pasting is coming from Stack Overflow, you really want to do that. So, all these things are open source and available in our uh, GitHub repo. And as an open source company, we are uh, partners of the open chain. We are very active in the, in the open chain um, uh, compliance coding work group and export control. We are members of the Eclipse Foundation and the Eclipse SDB, the Software Defined Vehicle Program. We are sponsors of the Software Heritage and we are members of the OSPO Alliance. And there will be more uh, during this year. Having an entirely open source platform and uh, free, as in free beer, access to the knowledge base plus um, open data contributions quickly gather an ecosystem around our, uh, uh, our uh, platform. Other open source SEA tools like Fossology, ORT and Fosslite. Is there anyone here from ORT or Fossology? There you go. These tools uh, integrate natively with ScanOSS. So for Sology, which is a tool that detects your uh, license headers and license files and copyright statements, now can tell you the license of a file that does not have a license header by calculating the fingerprints and sending them to the API and coming back with the results. We use scan code, as I, as I already mentioned, to detect the uh, licenses. And, and there are also commercial SCA vendors, commercial SCA suppliers, that use also our technology to either improve the results or to provide snippet level visibility. Trust Source in Germany is one of them. There are others that I cannot mention due to confidentiality. There are auditing firms using the knowledge base. The, actually, the, the Scan of a sense has been tested in course. I mean, the, the FSFE um, case in Italy a couple of years ago was actually I mean, gathered the evidence uh, using Scan of a sense. And there's a bunch of universities contributing to the hosting of this free uh, API. But the, the ultimate, there are two points in this, in this slide. One is that we have solved this problem. We have made this bar that measures. Now there is a standard way of comparing code and finding similarities and snippets and, and files. And before you had a bunch of proprietary tools with different proprietary algorithms and proprietary databases, which means the output was never apples to apples. While now if you scan with Fossology or ORT or Fosnite or scan OSS directly or through any of the tools that integrate with scan OSS, you get to the same results. And the other point in, in, in this is that if you at your company, uh, if, if your company is using tools, proprietary tools, to actually uh, enforce the internal processes to detect presence of open source, I mean, the more tools you use, the better. And it's fine with using proprietary tools. But you must use scan of sense, otherwise you will not have the visibility that any student will have from a home computer, because anyone can use this. So it's a major, major issue 
if you're not actually having the same level of, of visibility. Now on open data, I think I'm going quite fast, so maybe we're going to have a lot of time for, for questions and, and answers. On open data, um, well, we have our input and, and algorithms, and then uh, we made this first step of providing a free access to the knowledge base. This is not scan OSS providing access to uh, free access to, to people. Instead, we wanted to disengage this from the company and we launched the foundation. That was two, three years ago. The Software Transparency Foundation is hosting this project called OSSKB. And, and OSSKB.org is the default API URL that you will find hardcoded in every single uh, application we make. So if you use uh, Python, for example, you can B3 uh, install ScanOSS and then you scan OSS by scan the directory and you get all the results. You don't need a username, a password, nothing. It's, it's, there's no authentication. This is free and anonymous to everyone through the foundation. Uh, and then we continue. Then we launched in 2022 the, the Pearl to CPE dataset. This is a dataset that connects the package URLs with the CPEs. So if you know your package URLs, you can check this data set to see if there are any vulnerability in the components you're using. And we did this as, a, as an open data because we figured there are so many free, as in free beer APIs that you can use today to query and see if you have vulnerabilities and we thought, hey, what, why don't we just go ahead and, and, and open this up? And the result is that there's a number of companies and open source communities making use of our data. And I, I will talk about that in, in detail uh, later on. Then after that, we launched this, this year, actually it was a, a few weeks ago, the Crypto Algorithms Open Dataset. That is the name, uh, and we thought, I mean, it's not a short name, but, but we wanted to have something that is descriptive. And, and this is an, a data set that defines the way that you uh, detect cryptographic algorithms. And it also has a placeholder for algorithm um, uh, attributes, because you need them for different uh, use cases. And we thought, you know, this, will be, this has been open source for quite some time. It was part of Miner, the tool that we use that will download and open up the stuff and detect bunch of things including cryptographic algorithms. There was nothing for detecting cryptographic algorithms, so we made our own uh, tool. And, and what we did is we disengaged that from, from Miner to have a standalone application, a data set and, and a, a sample script that you can actually now clone and then run it and detect the cryptographic algorithms in your code. Uh, and, and that is uh, actually CC0, that's public domain. We thought that, that data set should be open to facilitate uh, contributions. And there will be more steps this year. Some of them are going to be great, but I can't really announce them just yet. Now, the input and algorithms, um, the data we uh, collect and, and store is, um, in the knowledge base, is published open source and, and public domain only, as I mentioned before, there is nothing else. And, and we do not mine any data from our customers. When we say we are a data company, people tend to think, oh, you're going to look at my pictures in, in Instagram, and you're going to be mining my... No, we do not uh, handle any customer data. We have nothing from our customers in the knowledge base, only open source that's published. Um, the algorithms used are open source, Winnowing is a, is a snippet fingerprinting algorithm that's quite uh, old, so like three decades already. So we made our own implementation for this scale. Um, and the mining and the cryptographic detection from Miner as well. And as well as all the other open source tools we use. And we publish everything as open source and we try to use permissive licenses as much as we can. Then the OSS KB, I'll go a little bit more detail. As I mentioned, we launched this foundation and, and to provide this uh, uh, OSS KB.org service. 
uh, and, and that database is a subset of the full database. Not a subset in the, mean, in, in the meaning that it has less amount of components. It's the same exact amount of components and versions. It's not like you're going to be detecting more. What is lacking is everything that is not composition analysis. I mean, we do have a lot of other extra data layers uh, that we add on top, like cryptography, quality, security, and so on. So the idea with this is that open source developers and uh, researchers, they can actually detect, declare, and undeclare open source in the products. That's one, one function. Check if there is any plagiarism, uh, especially when using AI assisted tools, because you can uh, use uh, Chat GPT, for example, and Chat GPT will bring open source that you don't know about. And I think I had a, in, last year I presented an example uh, of us asking Chat GPT to write the winnowing algorithm, which is the snippet hashing in C. And ChatGPT brought exactly our, our implementation from GitHub, including long comments from developers. So, the, 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 this is serious, and we discussed this uh, material, I remember that last year. So, uh, that's one very useful uh, use case. And then also to integrate pipeline and, 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 and workflows with the, with the tool. So, the idea is to automate compliance. You can generate an s -bomb and then you plant that s in your code, and then you scan, is there something detected that is not in the s -bomb? Then you create a, a ticket in Jira, for example. And this kind of automation is possible. Being a, again, we're an API, so it's very easy to integrate, and then we have SDKs to facilitate integration, and then we have CLIs made with those SDKs, so there's plenty of tools to, to make it very, very easy. Um, also, something to keep in mind is that the OSS KB has limited resources. Everything has limited resources. So, there is, uh, you, you cannot really, if you start hammering the API, you will hit the limit. There is a limit that is set and that is actually it's changed based on availability. Um, so, that's one limitation of using the free API. Well, if you're a company, well, then you might want to just pay for a guaranteed throughput and guaranteed availability, or maybe even uh, getting the whole knowledge base on-prem, which is the, the, the usual case. Uh, but the idea in the foundation is that that API has to be available for the whole world. Now, we encourage organizations to contribute to the OSS KB, especially if they find it useful, um, because that could help in, in many ways. First, I mean, promoting, promoting the, the use of the OSS TV is something that always, always helps. Then, by getting contributions to the, to the uh, foundation, we can also finance what is needed to keep uh, you know, this, this, this service alive. And then, also, contributors also have the ability to mirror that we have universities mirroring the, the OSS KB. Of course, when the universities usually have um, incubators and they have European funds to these projects in these incubators, of course they want those projects and that, that software to be compliant. So the, the, the uh, license compliance is, uh, is, is, is a very important need there. Now, uh, prior to CPE, um, this data set again is a relationship between, between package URLs and CDEs. And this isn't something that you can do uh, automatically because the CPEs, I mean, I mean if, if you already have a CPE, if there is, there's already a vulnerability from a previous version, you already know the naming uh, vendor component pair that was uh, given by the NBD. But if it is something that hasn't really had any vulnerabilities in the past, there's no way to know until the, 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 the CPE is actually issued. So we have a team of curators that are always looking at this and looking not just CPE to package uh, to uh, package URL, but also package URL to package URL. That's another thing that needs curation. 
if you hit, for example, the Python API, then you would get some URLs for every component, but th those URLs don't really mean, sometimes mm, is the actual GitHub URL for the project, so then you have another package URL connected to the, to the PyPy package URL. But it's not always the case. So uh, the only way to do this effectively is to have uh, a team of curators. We have five curators dedicated to do this every day, and yet this data set is uh, free. There are daily updates, so if you check that, it's, it's uh, github.com slash scanlosses slash um, And this is very useful to periodically check for vulnerabilities. How to use it? There is, okay, the definitions are text files that are easily you know, maintained in a git, but we also have an automatically generated SQLite database. So if you just want to check for vulnerabilities in your components, you can pull that SQL database daily and make the comparison. It's very easy to, to automate. And how to contribute? Well, if you see that we're missing something, you, you can just uh, issue your, your pull request or, or uh, uh, pull request or an issue in GitHub and then the team will, will take it from there. And also following us is also something that helps if you go to GitHub and follow that, that uh, to, to keep up to date. Now, the other contribution, which is the, the crypto algorithms data set. There are three main use cases for knowing your cryptography, and the, the most popular one is uh, export control, ECCN classification. There is this gap between law and math, Law is made by lawyers and, you know, is there any cryptographer here? There you go. So when they say strong encryption or weak encryption or standard encryption, what, is this? what does that mean? Right? And, and, and then you know, the same way that cryptographers look at law, you know, lawyers look at cryptographers like it's totally blurry and and, and difficult to understand. And the problem is that law is made and then every country has its own legislation. And then every company within a country has its own interpretation for that legislation. So this is, this is a big problem. Every company, every large company has people dedicated to export control and they have, they maintain a list of algorithms with the attributes that they give to these algorithms and then they define based on that how is something going to be classified. It might be right, it might be wrong. So th this is a problem. And, and the problem is that when it comes to license compliance, it was very easy for companies to seek consensus and to cooperate. Uh, you always want to do your best and find, make sure that you're doing at least the same work that, that you're uh, other companies in the, in the market are doing. But when it comes to export control, it is quite tricky. See, the problem is that if you make a mistake in license compliance, it's uh, paid with damages. Copyright infringement is paid with damages. But if you make a mistake with trade compliance, it's more a booty in jail kind of a deal. And companies don't really want to have to put under public scrutiny the way that they actually do. Uh, that, that rationale is something that they don't want to share. So, so we thought, well, maybe if we make a contribution first, then companies will be able to have their opinion. By no means our list of algorithms is complete. And by no means the list of keywords required to detect the algorithms is complete. So it's much easier to start with something already for people to, to contribute. So that, that, that is the idea with, uh, at least when it comes to the export control uh, use case. Because if we as a community could manage to standardize uh, compliance, why not doing it with, with export control, with cryptography? It's about time. So the idea is to declare these algorithms in a standardized way, have a naming convention, and names and identifiers, just like we have for licenses in, uh, 
open source licenses, we should do the same with uh, cryptographic algorithms. And also the attributes, we should have a series of attributes for every algorithm. And of course the idea is to bring these declarations into S forms, Alexius. <laughs> and that's, that's something that, and, and SPDX already has this placeholder for, um, for export control. So that, that will simplify distribution, consumption and, and management, of course. So this is the actual um, uh, repo, so crypto algorithms open data set. And uh, I can zoom in and you can see what it is uh, about. So there's a directory with definitions, uh, documents and utilities. In the utilities there is a, a sample script that will allow you to um, you know, download a script and use leverage those definitions to detect cryptographic algorithms in your code. And this is all CC0. Again, we have a zoom in here, and this is the, um, the table that we maintain with the list of algorithms. And if you click on that, it will take you to the YAML file where you have. I mean, we thought YAML is the, the easiest way to, especially when in, in, in trade compliance, sometimes not, not all of them are developers, and, and it's easier to use the GitHub interface to you know, edit and add uh, an attribute or remove an attribute and so on. But it's not just export control. There are more use cases. There is security compliance. We have this crypto algorithm validation uh, program, the CAVP, which determines NIST recommended and FIPS approved algorithms. So companies want to comply with that. And there is also this quantum safety concern. Quantum computer will break uh, uh, certain algorithms. So companies don't worry about that because if you have um, development for products that last five, seven, ten years, then you really have to worry about this. Because by the time the product is ready, there will be quantum computers uh, available. And this is going to be a problem. But again, security compliance, quantum safety, export control starts by knowing your cryptographic composition. And that is the problem we're trying to solve. So, first of all, we invite you to check it out. It's, it's open, you can download it and detect your cryptography. Um, you can help your supply chain by using the definitions in an s -bomb, by adding detection to your tooling. Contribute with new definitions, again, that's not a complete list of algorithms, that's not a complete list of attributes, and evolve the, the specifications. Now, on the journey to open data. Next steps. So what we need to do is to continue to maintain what we have, which is quite a task. I mean, we have uh, lots of repos and lots of uh, uh, code there that we are maintaining. We need to continue to publish the, uh, the open source licenses. Uh, <clears throat> the so under open source licenses and software that we develop. We need to mature the current contribution policy. And we need to consolidate and create and increase our use uh, base. I mean, that it's not easy to get adoption. When you have an open source company, it is not easy. It's very easy for, for people to use, but it's very difficult for having people contributing back. So, the best way to do this is not to host ourselves the, the, the contributions, but also but instead to bring them into foundations, to bring them into, into projects. And that's actually something that we need to talk about this specific cryptographic algorithm, Alexio. So we'll talk about that later. So the OSS KB, we must continue to, to keep it uh, running and healthy. So far, it's been quite stable. I have to say, we haven't really had any, any major issues but it costs time and money to do that. Um, and we need to continue to develop what's behind because that's growing and continue to add new sources. Like for example, now there is a, uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Ocelot. It's a project that is curating licenses in components. So we are actually incorporating that as a new uh, license source. There's always new stuff coming up. And um, 
The idea is to continue to support the foundation, to increase the number of organizations that can host the mirror, to have the, the API available uh, and have more capacity, increasing the levels when, when possible. And then we need to bring more sponsors to the actual foundation. That's the only way to, to do that. Now, on the already published uh, data sets, we need to also continue to enrich them, to give them current and, and healthy. And we need to consolidate them as open data collaborative pro uh, projects, or, or donate them to some other foundation. I mean, the idea is that this ha actually has to continue and continue to grow. And, and this is a major, major challenge. And then, of course, based on our capacity, publish and maintain additional data sets as open data. And again, we already have things uh, in the pipe coming up this year that are going to be great. Um, and then also collaborate in, in open governance ecos uh, ecosystems, ecosystems to provide expertise and reinforce publishing and, and maintaining the data sets. So, the summary you cannot protect or comply with what you cannot see. I mean, this is a basic foundational. Uh, knowing your software composition is foundational to license compliance, to export control, to security, and everything that is related with the risks of using uh, open source. Risk of using third party code. I mean, doesn't, it's not that open source is a bad thing. You just need to make sure that you are fulfilling uh, all your obligations. So standardizing and how will we declare the artifacts is like giving glasses to that Frankie. Uh, I think, I don't know if anyone was here, but I, I explained last year why we're using a Frankenstein monster as our mascot. It's just that building software today is putting a Frankenstein together, bits and pieces from the open source community, and, and that's how we use the, the Frankie as our mascot. Last year I brought Frankie dolls, and I gave them away, gave them away but this year they didn't make it on time, unfortunately. So the idea is going from open source, through open data, to open standards. That is the ultimate goal. We're getting there slowly, but we're getting there. If you're interested in knowing more about uh, ScanOSS, you have here uh, some QR codes. Basically, ScanOSS.com is our piece of web. GitHub.com slash ScanOSS is, is uh, where we have all the, the repos. OSSKB.org. If you hit that uh, URL, you get to the landing page of that free API, and it, would, it gives you a breakdown of all the million URLs that have been uh, downloaded and indexed. And, and that is actually current uh, information. And then the, the published data sets, the Proto CPE, is, and, and the crypto algorithms open data set, you know, the URLs there, and some QR codes. So that's all I have as far as materials. So we have 22 minutes. For questions. I see a question in the far left corner. That is a little. Thank you. I liked your closing point about how you cannot protect or comply with what you cannot see. Uh, so since software is a Frankenstein of free software today very often, it's, I imagine it's quite difficult to create what you've created, um, but at least you're analyzing free, well, you say open source or free software, and so you have the source code. What would it be like to do the same sort of analysis when proprietary software uh, is involved? You, you can certainly do that. Actually, one thing that I did not mention uh, is that you can use our open source to make your own knowledge base. And I, I mean, our customers are doing that. And I see two use cases. One is making a database of proprietary software. And companies use that to prevent IP leakage when contributing to open source products. That's usually a big problem. And you solve it like that. So you... Sorry, I meant when you have a proprietary dependency. Oh, proprietary dependencies. Well, it's, it's the same case. I mean, in, in our knowledge base, we only have open source. And if there would be a, a database of proprietary dependencies, it's something that 
a company would have to create themselves. And they can do that using our open source. But do you need the source code in order to create the database? Uh, to create the database, you need either, yeah, you could, you could detect, I mean, if you have the source code, you'll be able to detect snippets from that proprietary code. If you don't, at least you can detect uh, binaries by hash comparison. Then there is another use case of why would we want to make our own knowledge base. And that is uh, when companies want to detect usage of specific versions of specific um, open source components. And I give you one example, SSPL, um, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Mongo, I mean, all, all these uh, components that change to SSPL, there are companies that do not want to use a line of code from the SSPL versions. So you can maintain a knowledge base and then scan and find if you're actually using that, uh, those versions that are banned or forbidden. That's another use case. something that is not interesting, like for example, um, I don't know, an, an array with the 12 names of the months of the year in French, for example. Nobody can claim authorship for that. So that, That's actually a, a real match because we're matching, but nobody can claim authorship for that. And in that case, we contain, we, we keep a block of uh, in, uh, IDs to ignore in the snippet, uh, snippet IDs to ignore. And this is part of our uh, public people. That's on the server side. Then on the, on the client side, you can also have many rules to de determine the things that you want to avoid. You can make your own ignore list. Like for example, companies sometimes create an ignore list with their proprietary headers because in many cases match open source because they use the same header with the company name and address and so on. Uh, that, that's another use case. Uh, you will always have false positives. I mean, uh, of course, you know, everybody claims, every SCA vendor claims that they have the lowest possible uh, number of, uh, of, uh, of false positives. We put a lot of effort into actually ruling out false positives from the beginning. But we also give the, the, the user all the means to actually make their own rules and, and maintain their own uh, rules to, to rule out false positives. And then ultimately, with, with um, uh, the paid version of the knowledge base, there is a second set of snippet hashes that are overimposed to actually roll out false positives and in, in, uh, increase uh, resolution in the actual matching. But do you uh, provide also a confidence uh, of how uh, for the uh, uh, matches is just if it matches 100% it is a cheapness? Uh, well, when, when you define the, I mean, the blob of uh, things to ignore are already not matching. I mean, you, we have that in the, in the open source, uh, you know, the scanning engine is, is open source and it contains a blob of things to ignore. Uh, and then you can also do that on the client side. Uh, you will always find, again, false positives, but the important thing here is that this is a standard way of doing it. And there is a number of companies and communities doing it, right? So you will always have false positives. We have a much lower percentage of false positives compared to proprietary tools. But at the end of the day, it's something you have to deal with. I mean, it's like having false positives doesn't mean that you that it's okay not to scan or compare snippets. I mean, the the seat belt is uncomfortable in the car, right? But you still have to use it. Uh, so it's the same thing with uh, with plagiarism. No, but when you mean that, that causes a problem if you use it for S one generation, and then you are not entirely sure this is just because your code is very similar, even if you have no one exposed to that code, or if it's just because someone has copied it, you can't actually tell unless you have proper license. Right, and right. Well, that's why it, it, 
when it comes to automation, one thing that, that we do and we have that proprietary tools don't have is the option to set up and define the context for what you are actually scanning. So if, if you know that you're using, because then uh, false positives in that sense means getting a match to something that is not the actual version of the component that you're expecting, right? Uh, it's, it's more uh, matching precision than, than, than a false positive. I mean, there is a thousand right questions, uh, right answers to the question, where does this, come, this file coming from? If it's a libz file, for example, it's in every Linux version slash flavor and then any Android version slash flavor and it's actually in deep set. Uh, so the context allows you to define the composition that you already know you have. So any match to libz on anything else will be relevant when a context is provided. So that actually drastically rules out false positives and increases precision. So that's one thing in which we're also different. I don't know if I answered the question or if I made it more complicated. <laughs> more or less. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about snippets uh, detection. Yep. So, you gave a good example just from your answer that you know, some snippet can be seen in many places. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible with your database to track the original appearance? In other words, do you have some yes. timestamp components in the database to see where it appeared first? Yes. Uh, the default answer to where does this come from, if you, there is no uh, context, is the oldest known release date for that file. So that is actually the, the origin. For which file? Right? I mean, if, if you're like... Yeah, multiple files, like, uh, can yeah. you see the timestamp of all of them and just find the first one? Yeah, t take for example libz. If you're matching a file from libz, it would actually be in every Linux, Android, flavor, and then... But if, if you look at the actual release date, it would be first in libz. So if there is no context, that file will be matching libz. And your database contains the timestamp? Yes, yes, we, we have the release date for every single file. Of the 100 billion files we have in 